With 40 million Brits using social media and dating apps, it's quickly become the most popular way we connect with people. People meet in a whole wide variety of different ways online, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. There really is something for everyone. But by uploading our lives online, we can become exposed to real danger. Predators can meet with more vulnerable individuals and exert that level of control over them. Crimes involving dating apps and social media are placing increasing pressure on the police, who've investigated more than 20,000 alleged offences over the past three years, including assaults, rape, child sex grooming, and even murder. The technology makes it a lot easier for those with bad intent. How safe is meeting someone online? Today, the majority of us interact and communicate via social media. And with over 60% of the population signed up, the most popular platform is Facebook. The thing about the cyber world is that it offers access to millions and millions of users all over the world. And now you can connect with anybody in an instant. And whilst a lot of people think that's really positive, it's actually changed the face of predators. It's given people a mask to wear. And essentially, if you have a laptop or a smartphone, in your own front room, you can be attacked without knowing it. On the 31st of October 2015, 15-year-old Leicestershire schoolgirl Kaylee Haywood received a Facebook message from unemployed 27-year-old Luke Harlow. After exchanging more than 2,600 messages over 13 days, Kaylee agreed to stay at Harlow's flat in Ibstock, where she was introduced to 28-year-old landscape gardener Stephen Beedman, the man who raped and murdered her. Six days after her parents last saw her, the search for Kaylee ended as her body was carried across a field. Candles were lit and condolences were left for a teenager whose death, her family say, has left a gaping hole in their lives. Why Kaylee? Why did this happen to our beautiful daughter? We have to live with the heartache forever. Kaylee was a happy, bubbly, family orientated young lady. She wanted to go to college, get a career behind her, travel and then have a family of her own. Kaylee was a prolific uh, social communicator, whether that be by text or using Facebook or whatever social platform she wanted to use, but it was constant. Through social media platforms, unbeknown to her parents, Kaylee formed an online relationship with Luke Harlow. Luke Harlow was 27. He spent a lot of his time sitting in his flat, uh, sending messages to young girls. His uh, tagline that he used was Luke Fun Times Harlow. His conversations with the girls that he spoke to online tended to revolve around partying and coming round to mine where we'll have a party. Here was a story unfolding of how a man older than Kaylee had inveigled his way into her life, had developed a degree of trust with her. QC Miranda Moore, the lead counsel in the prosecuting team, has been on this case since the start. The messages went from, hi, who are you? I've seen your picture, you're very pretty, to, oh, I'd like you to be my princess. I'll treat you right. I'll be your boyfriend. Have you got a boyfriend? Oh, you're so pretty. How come you haven't got a boyfriend? Kaylee clearly felt that she was moving into a loving, trusting relationship with a man who cared deeply for her, who made all sorts of promises, who flattered her to the hilt. With the power and speed of online communications, Luke Harlow managed to gain the trust of Kaylee in a matter of days. He sympathised with her when she had a row with her mum and dad about something trivial. He then started engineering the questioning over to what sort of sexual encounters she'd had, that he wanted to have her for himself. He got under her skin very quickly. What Kayleigh didn't know was at exactly the same time, Luke Harlow was sending almost identical messages to at least two other girls. Whilst Kayleigh thought she was really special, she wasn't, I'm afraid, special to Luke Harlow at all. 
and it was almost like a fishing expedition that send out some messages, hey, how are you? And let's see who bites, and Kaylee bit. He starts to talk about her coming over and how if she comes over, he'll buy drinks, they'll have a party, they'll have a good time. And she responds to the flattery, saying that she'd love to come over, she'd love to meet him. But obviously, she's going to have to lie to her parents in order to do that. On the 13th of November at 6 p.m., Kaylee was dropped off outside Ibstock Community College, having told her parents that she would be meeting a friend and then going back to stay at her house. A minute later, Kaylee came out. If she wasn't visiting her friend, she had arranged to meet Luke Harlow, who had lured her in to his trap. The thing about Facebook is that it offers him a platform where he can provide a particular aspect of his world that's wholly untrue, but is very coercive in nature. Young girls feel flattered and believe what he's telling them. And that's the power of social networks. You can be anybody you want to be. Clearly believing that Luke Harlow was her boyfriend, Kaylee went to Harlow's house in Ibstock on Friday the 13th of November where she stayed the night on the promise of a party and a good time. As far as we can tell, she stayed perfectly happily on the Friday night. We can tell that because she sent messages to people, she took a selfie, that sort of thing. Looks like they watched films, they moved the mattress from the bedroom to the sitting area so that it was effectively in front of the television. They had a meal, they consumed an enormous amount of drink, mostly vodka. Kaylee seems to have been perfectly happy to stay on Saturday the 14th because she messaged her mum asking whether she could still stay at the friend's house. And the mum, thinking she was at the friend's house, said yes. Later that evening, Luke Harlow ran out of alcohol and mixers, so went over to his neighbour's house, Stephen Beedman, to ask for a favour. Harlow decided to get a lift from Stephen Beedman, who has a van, into the village of Ibstock where they got some more drink and you actually buy some vodka. When they come back from that trip, Beedman is then introduced to Kaylee. He invited Beedman back to a flat where he was with an underage girl to party with the two of them. It was a good deal of showing off, sort of, look what I've got. From that moment on, things were about to get very sinister. No one knows exactly what happened in the house, but from nine o'clock onwards, Kaylee, an avid social media user, never used her phone again. Still to come. We know there was a fight. And Kaylee made a break for it, semi-naked, into the night. He took her to the ground and then using one of the rocks, he delivered many, many blows to her face. In November 2015, Leicestershire schoolgirl Kaylee Haywood, unbeknown to her parents, spent a Friday and Saturday night at 27-year-old Luke Harlow's flat in Ibstock. Harlow had contacted 15-year-old Kaylee via Facebook just 13 days before, and they'd already exchanged over 2,600 messages. On the Saturday night, Harlow invited his neighbor over, a 28-year-old landscape gardener called Stephen Beedman. Little did Kaylee know, that she would be raped and murdered by him. During her stay at Harlow's flat, Kaylee had been actively texting friends and family and checking in on her social media. However, at 9 p.m. on the Saturday evening, Kaylee stopped using her phone. She was texting um, and then communication stops from her and there's no evidence that her phone ran out of power, which obviously could be a reason why you would stop. Um, her charger was plugged in to the wall in Harlow's flat. She stopped communicating because she wasn't allowed to communicate and, and that she probably wanted to leave, but wasn't allowed to leave. We don't know what happened in the flat that night, but we do know there was a fight and we do know there was banging and crashing and we do know Kaylee made a break for it, semi-naked, into the night. On Sunday morning, a local builder found Kaylee's phone on the A447 as he was driving his van through Ibstock. He called the last number dialed, which happened to be Kaylee's best friend. I woke on the Sunday morning to my phone ringing, and it was Kaylee's best friend. And she said, could she speak to Kaylee? 
us and a lot of hours rang, I thought Kayla was with you. And she explained to me that she hadn't seen Kelly since the Thursday and alarm bells rang. Where was she? I panicked and I phoned the police, reported her missing. Police officer came over within the hour, asked me if he got, Kelly got any devices, fetched it from my bedroom and he went through it and his face told me everything, that there was harrowing messages on there. What he said to Kaylee was this, got you all to myself now, babe. You have to give me kisses whether you want to or not. We need to have drinks soon, babe, so that I can get you drunk and take advantage. I'll make you take your clothes off first. I'd be too tempted to do naughty stuff if you was in my bed naked. On that iPad, there was clear evidence that Kayleigh had been in significant contact with a man called Luke Harlow. So the police inquiries quickly moved to Ibstock. Luke Harlow was arrested and initially that was for kidnapping. Luke Harlow maintained that he knew nothing about Kayleigh's disappearance. His version of events was that he went to sleep and left Beedman and Kayleigh talking. And when he woke up, they were gone. We took possession of all of his devices that he had. We started to look at the Facebook accounts of Harlow to try and break down what's being said, who's saying it, whether or not offences are being committed. And how did you become friends on Facebook? How did that come about? Um, um, I, can't, I can't remember if I added her or she added me. I'm not 100% sure. I've got like 2,000 odd people in it. He was quite open about the fact that Kaylee had stayed at his house, that she'd been round there and stayed on the Friday night and was there on the Saturday night. He lied about knowing how old Kaylee was. He said she was 19 and he was presented with documentary evidence of the fact that he knew full well she was 15. Yeah, well, I obviously feel bad, don't I? Why do you feel bad? Because she's too young. Because she's too young. For what? For coming and stay in my mind for starting start, I know And what else? One other stuff. What's the other stuff? Um. Having examined Luke Harlow's online accounts, police quickly discovered that he was in fact a serial groomer. He had said to other girls, having sex with drunk, unconscious girls is my favorite. I wish I could kidnap you for Christmas but I would probably be arrested and sent to prison. If I kidnap you, I'm keeping you. After being presented with evidence, Harlow admitted to grooming Kaylee and to having sexual activity with her. He also admitted to grooming two other underage girls. However, he stuck with his story that he fell asleep leaving Stephen Beedman with Kaylee in his flat. The police then arrested Beedman, who had fresh facial injuries, which raised suspicion. Beedman spent from the point when he was first interviewed on that Monday, all the way through into Wednesday, lying. We don't know where Kaylee is. We don't know if she's injured somewhere. We don't know if she's not alive, if she is alive. And we urgently need to find Kaylee Haywood. We want to give you an opportunity, if you know her, if and if you indeed know where she is, tell us right now at the beginning of the day. No. You don't know where I she is? I don't know where she is. With Harlow and Beedman in custody, the extensive search to find Kaylee alive continued. We had hundreds of police officers. Derbyshire Mountain Rescue were involved in assisting with the search. We had the scouts out, we had police cadets. We had people from the village of Ibstock, everybody was doing everything they could to try and find Kaylee. All the time, one person knew exactly where she was and was refusing to tell us. But certainly Stephen Beedman spent the best part of three days lying through his teeth. Beedman claimed Kaylee had left the flat in the middle of the night after he tried to kiss her. If you've done nothing and she's run out of the flat, you don't run out of her house just because someone's kissing you. You're not doing anything, so what's happening? I honestly can't remember. I've been drinking. We'd all been drinking. Whilst the police were desperately looking into every lead given, 
more alarming evidence was being unearthed. We found a red bra, which was very quickly identified by Stephanie Haywood as being Kaylee's bra. And then as we got into the next day of the search, and on the Monday and the Tuesday, some of Kaylee's clothing was found in a field across the road from Sense Valley Park. We very quickly established that Beedman, in his capacity as a landscape gardener, had a lockup. And searching that lockup and searching the skips and the area around that lockup, we found Kaylee's bag and a, and a top. And then when Beedman, uh, whilst still lying and telling us lies about how he got the injuries that he had, dropped in that he'd been doing some work in some farmer's fields. We then went there and we found a bag of property which included the bloodstained clothing. Um, that was Beedman's clothing with Kaylee's blood on it. On the Wednesday afternoon, three and a half days after Kaylee was reported missing, Beedman finally started to tell the truth of what happened when Kaylee ran out of Harlow's flat in the early hours of the morning on a freezing November night. She must have been in a panic. No woman runs out of a flat in a November night just wearing her top half clothing and no shoes. She had a phone with her. We know she got about 10 metres or so from Harlow's front door before she was brought to the ground by Beedman. Beedman then took Kaylee out of the little estate where the flats were and across the main road into a parkland area. We know that because Kaylee's smashed phone was found on the road. Stephen Beedman has walked her over into Sense Valley Park and in the car park area of Sense Valley Park, he has raped Kaylee. Beedman is maybe somebody who saw an opportunity. He saw a vulnerable young woman who was scared and he took advantage of her fully. And then when she was terrified and clearly wasn't going to keep this information to herself about the rape, it's as if he had to silence her. And they then walked out of the park and along a, a slightly convoluted route which took them over farmland towards a disused railway line. It was along unmade paths across ploughed up farmland, wet, dirty, to an area where there was standing water and an old railway line. As she walked this long walk, it was best part of a mile or so, into the area of the farmland. Now, whether she thought she was going to be able to run away, she was young and fit, whether she thought she was going to be able to talk her way out of it, the walk ended in an area which was close to some standing water. I mean, she must have been absolutely terrified because by now, he's attacked her, he's raped her. She must have known what was going to happen. Something then happened at that point, but there was a struggle. According to Beedman, Kayleigh hit him in the face with a brick and made good her escape and that he chased her and hit her with the brick and this is when she died. He took her to the ground in some way and then using one of the rocks, he delivered many, many blows to her face. And I believe that the way that he murdered Kaylee was to engage that child in a terrifying circumstance that went on for a long period of time. He humiliated her, he walked her into fields and forests, and then he murdered her horribly. I mean, that's very powerful. It's very voyeuristic to witness another human in absolute pain and terror and to continue with that action. And I believe that that suggests something about your nature that's very, very dark. When she was found, she was found naked, partially covered by undergrowth, and she was only found after Mr. Beedman told the police the general location of where she was. The injuries to Kaylee, particularly to her head and face, were so horrific that it was impossible to allow her parents to see her in that state, and she had to be identified by dental records. I remember being in my sitting room, and two police officers coming through. I knew on the faces, but I didn't want them to say what they was going to say, and they said it. My friend sat in the kitchen, and all she, all she heard was a howl from the, from the sitting room, from me falling to my knees. It's, Heart Police spent the day scouring the area close to where they found her late last night as they continue to question two men in their 20s on suspicion of her murder. 
Her family believes she may have gone to meet a man she'd contacted online. In June 2016, the case was taken to trial at Nottingham Crown Court. Harlow admitted grooming and sexual activity, and Beedman admitted raping and murdering Cayley. They both denied false imprisonment. We had the blessing of Cayley's family, and we had an evidential basis for going on with the false imprisonment charge. And we did that because we were confident it would show the proper picture of what had happened. Nobody runs away in the middle of the night half-dressed, unless there's a really imperative reason for doing so. And that piece of evidence alone, even though there was more evidence to back up what had happened, persuaded us that a jury would convict both men of false imprisonment. The jury ruled a 10 to 1 majority, and both men were found guilty of falsely imprisoning Cayley. Stephen Beedman got 35 years for murder, rape, and false imprisonment, and Luke Harlow got 12 years for sexual grooming, sexual activity with a child, and false imprisonment. Today we have justice for our beautiful daughter, but that doesn't change anything for us. We have to live with the heartache forever. Cayley's family wanted not only to create a lasting memory of her, but to make sure that online grooming didn't grasp another innocent life. I'm glad that they can't come out. They're not here to do it to some other poor innocent young girl. But I have to think of Kaylee rather than them. And that's why we're trying to raise awareness ourselves. This was a story that had to be distributed as far as possible as a wake-up call to children and adults about that threat that exists when you decide to have an online presence. Probably the best way to try and get that message across was to make a film. I'll never forget the first time we met. The bogeyman is online in your son or daughter's bedroom. We decided we have to show this to groups of school children, to every single child aged 11 and above. And I'm here today to tell you about the Kayleigh Haywood love story. I think he might be the one. I really do. If you wouldn't invite them into your house, don't invite them into your social media lives. He wants me to meet his friends, so he must be serious about it. I get off me, go away! Help me! Help! If anybody contacts you on social media sites and starts asking you personal questions, we want to know about it. What I want to come from this is the awareness to get out there, children to be safe, parents to be aware that every day something like this is happening. I think it needs to be part of the curriculum. You know, they need awareness in schools as well as parents and children out of school. Just in Leicestershire, over 40 disclosures from children having watched the film, they're coming forward and telling us what's happening in their lives. That is leading to active investigations. Kaylee lives on to protect other children. And as Stephanie has said, if that film keeps one child and one child only safe and alive, then it's been worth making. Still to come. The cannibal killer who used a dating app to lure a police officer to his home where he butchered him and dissolved his body parts in acid. I said to the woman, I said, what did it smell of? And she turned around and said, it smells like rotten flesh. Since the mid-90s, the internet has opened up the world of love, with more than 90 million users around the globe actively seeking dates online. Advancements in technology have made online dating even more convenient with smartphones and apps that can pinpoint your nearest love match, offering something for everyone. One of the most popular apps, renowned for instant casual hookups, is gay dating app Grindr. Its immediacy is at the heart of its appeal, but simultaneously, it's also a weakness. 
One of the things with Grindr is there are certain individuals on there whose mentality is, I just want a body, anybody. If somebody has that psychology, maybe they don't see you as a person, they see you as a piece of meat, something to be played with and often discarded. On the 1st of April 2016, serving police officer PC Gordon Semple left a meeting at the Shangri-La Hotel and logged onto the gay dating app Grindr. Unbeknownst to him, he responded to an invitation to a sex party from a man who would brutally murder him. These are the last known images of Gordon alive. Is there anything you can tell me about what you did between the 1st and the 7th before you were arrested? Comment. The man in police custody is 50-year-old Italian Stefano Brizzi. Brizzi was an openly gay, successful computer programmer who previously worked in a lucrative £70,000 a year job at Morgan Stanley Bank. After struggling for years with the contrast of his strict Catholic upbringing and his homosexuality, he contracted HIV and hepatitis C a diagnosis he referred to as his death sentence. He may have had huge issues around the fact that he had a life-threatening long-term illness, and that may have made him very, very angry. And his way of coping with that grief was to externalise it, to affect others. In 2015, he left Morgan Stanley, having developed an addiction to crystal meth. Breeze's life began to spiral out of control as he delved into the world of chemsex, a byword for having sex whilst high on drugs. When he meets Gordon Semple, he's already checked out that this is an individual who wants to engage in chemsex with him. So both of these characters are willing to push boundaries. So he automatically knows that he can have this man in a vulnerable situation. PC Semble and the defendant then went on to invite other men to join them here on the Peabody estate in Southwark. Only two showed any interest. The first changed his mind when he heard the possibility that drugs could be involved. But when the second man arrived, he was greeted by Breeze's voice on the intercom. It is at this point that police believe Gordon Semple was being murdered. When Gordon Semple arrives at the flat, Breeze isn't necessarily attracted to him, and his excuse for murdering him was that he didn't feel that there was that compatibility. That's how delusional he is. The fact that he isn't connected to him physically means that he can murder him. He may as well make use of the situation. PC Semple had a long-term partner. When he didn't return home, his partner made over 20 unanswered calls to Gordon Semple's phone, growing increasingly concerned for his safety. When no reply came the following morning, his partner reported him missing to the police. On the very same day, Breezy was seen at his local DIY store, purchasing plastic buckets, saws, and acid. What no one could have known was that it was part of a gruesome plan to dispose of Gordon's body. Taking inspiration from his favorite TV series, Breaking Bad, Breezy copied the main character, a crystal meth cook, who destroys a corpse using similar tools and chemicals. The fact that he has such an obsession with Breaking Bad suggests that he's getting confused about what reality and fantasy is. This is a grown man who is completely drawn in by a program that covers his own dependency. When Brizzy goes out and purchases the materials that he needs to dispose of the body, 
we see him almost automatically following a script. He's seen this on television and now it's in his world, he's making it real. There is almost this complete loss of reality and I feel like he fundamentally believes he's in that show. Having strangled PC Semple to death, Breezy spent the next six days going to extraordinary lengths to dispose of all the evidence. He butchered the body and attempted to dissolve it in a bath of acid. When this didn't work, he resorted to hiding parts of the mutilated corpse around the flat. He even made a dash for the Thames, where he threw in Gordon's police badge and a dismembered foot. It's as if he starts to be fueled by the show. So watching the way that somebody disposes of a body goes from being something fantastical to actually a reality that he plays out. So fundamentally, it's almost like he's getting lost in his own world. The addiction has spiraled to a degree where what is real and what is fantasy collide. But what he didn't know was that the smell of the dissolving body parts would be impossible to hide. Stephen Harris, Briz's neighbour, was growing concerned as to the cause of the foul smell. The first thing I thought was, it smelt like a, a dead body. I'd never smelt a dead body before in my life, but that's how uh, it smelt like to me. Stephen decided to investigate. He knocked on the door, but when there was no answer, he peered through the letterbox and was immediately repelled by the stench, only to be met by Breezy. As I pulled the letterbox down, he opened up the door. I said, oh, excuse me, mate. I said, um, there's been a complaint about the smell in the block. He took man and said to me, um, sorry about that, um, I'm cooking for a friend. When the smell didn't go, Stephen knew something wasn't right. He turned to his brother to confirm his suspicions. Two days later, I went up to my brother's house and um, I said, oh, Mark, do us a favour, come with me and have a smell. So we both come from my brother's house, back up to here, He's got a card making out, he was CID, banging on the door. He opened up the door, he was in his boxer shorts with the glasses, what looked like um, Tom Cruise out of Top Gun. Virtually, he said the same thing. Um, sorry, mate, I'm just cooking for a friend. Consumed by a sense of wrongdoing, they decided to call the emergency services. The first officer on the scene reported that Breezy opened the door in nothing more than a pair of swimming trunks and his trademark sunglasses. He led them to the bathroom, where the remains of PC Semple were decomposing. When the ambulance crew turned up, we waited and we waited, and then the ambulance crew come back downstairs. I said to the woman, I said, what did it smell of? And she turned around and she said, it smells like rotten flesh. On the discovery of the grisly scene in Breezy's flat, Police officers cordoned off the area and called in forensics. I passed through my neighbour. She rang up. She said, Steve, what's going on? We can't get in the block. I said, what do you mean, sir, we can't get in the block? It's all been cornered off. There's tape, there's police. Then it dawned on me what was going on. Police officers described the scene as surreal. They found a book called The Satanic Bible and messages scrawled to the devil but nothing would prepare them for what they were about to discover. Gordon's lungs had been flushed down the toilet, while parts of his spine and hand were found in bin bags, and more chillingly, parts of him were identified in the oven, in cooking pots, and on chopsticks in Breeze's kitchen. There was sky news, it was this, it was that. It was all cornered off, it was, it was, it was chaotic. Breezy was arrested for the murder of Gordon Semple and for the obstruction of the coroner due to the mutilation of his body. I wanted out. I couldn't handle it no more. I wanted out, um, because it, it, it was, it was, no word of right, it was getting me, getting me down, kicking walking past that door and knowing exactly what went on. On the 18th of October, 2016, Breezy's trial for murder began at the Old Bailey. His neighbour, Stephen, was summoned as a key witness to give evidence against Breezy. I'm sitting in the dock, and on my left, there's a big glass thing. He's sitting on his own with two um, security guards by him, and he's got those same glasses on, and I will never forget that. 
Breezy claimed in court that Gordon had died as a result of a sex game gone wrong. But he changed his story throughout the investigation, at one moment blaming his addiction to crystal meth for the murder of PC Semple, and the next declaring that the devil had told him to kill, kill, kill. If you say, I'm hearing voices, that people will have the conclusion that you might be suffering from a mental illness, which means that you may be diminished in your responsibility when you carry out a plan of action. The shocking details of the murder and dismembering of the body were revealed, but one piece of evidence clearly stood out. The jury heard that one of Gordon's ribs was found in the kitchen bin with bite marks that matched Breeze's lower teeth. Me and my brother went up in court. We give her evidence, and two days later, um, it carried on because the jury couldn't reach a verdict with manslaughter or murder. It took the jury 30 hours to deliberate and come up with a majority verdict to determine whether Breezy should be convicted of murder or a lesser charge of manslaughter due to diminished responsibility. However, they were allowed by the judge to form a majority, which found Stefano Breezy guilty of murder by 10 to 2. The verdict has been welcomed by the Metropolitan Police, who were faced with investigating the gruesome killing of one of their own. People saying, like, oh, you're a hero, you and your brother. No, he wasn't a hero. It was just like, it was a spare of the moment. Um, I smelt it. I didn't realise what was going on. But then who would have thought that sort of thing would happen in the block where you live? In February 2017, convicted murderer Stefano Breezy was found dead in his cell at HMP Belmarsh. Still to come, the online romantic who promised a loving relationship to a single mum, only to stab her 13 times with a bread knife. This suggests that he was feeling rageful and angry, and something sparked that behaviour in him. You can be chatting happily to somebody that you've never met online, and you have no way of knowing what kind of a person they are until you meet. Online dating has become a normal part of the way we connect, but as a result, we've grown complacent about the dangers that can come with it. For some people, it's the only way to meet a potential partner. One of those looking for love online was 44-year-old Usha Patel, a single mum and full-time carer for her young autistic son. She was on the lookout for somebody to be with, somebody to share her life with. And it was on Oasis.com where 35-year-old Miles Donnelly captured her heart. Usher had, had gone online looking for love and ended up being murdered in her own home with her son in the next room by somebody that she thought she could trust. Unbeknownst to Usher, Donnelly had a long-standing history of criminal offences, including possession of a knife, racially aggravated assault and battery. Donnelly presented himself online as a, as a nice, caring figure, somebody who was also looking for love. Usha and Donnelly quickly started exchanging regular messages. Donnelly told her everything she wanted to hear. We know that she's looking for something commitment-wise. He implied that he wanted to have a relationship with her and she fell for that. They exchanged messages for a few months. Usha shared pictures of her son. He was saying he'd look after her and, and protect her. Seven months after their first online contact, Donnelly sought a physical relationship with Usha, and their messages and phone calls became increasingly sexual. They eventually fixed a date to meet at her flat in Cricklewood, northwest London. This is a relationship that has been built with pictures and ideas, and she feels she knows him. So when they actually connect for the first time and are intimate, she feels that she's meeting her partner. On the night of the 7th of October 2015, at around 8pm, and after Usha had put her son to bed, Donnelly arrived at her flat. They'd had a lot to drink. Uh, Donnelly had taken cocaine, and they'd taken their clothes off, ready for sex, at which point he attacked her. 
Donnelly beat Usha around the head, strangled her, and as she lay dying, stabbed her in the stomach 13 times with a bread knife. The fact that Miles Donnelly kills Usha in such a violent, frenzied way suggests that he was feeling rageful and angry, and something sparked that behavior in him. Donnelly fled the scene, leaving behind a trail of evidence, including his underpants, socks, T-shirt, hoodie, and even his house keys with a personal picture attached. The worst part of this case was that Usher's son was actually in the flat at the time of the murder and, and remained there until the uh, discovery of the body the next day. The following morning, Usha's father came to collect his grandson. He let himself in and was met by his grandson. The young boy came out and said, uh, I think the words were, mummy's not well. Usha's father then made the tragic discovery of his daughter's lifeless body on the sofa, hidden under a duvet. He called the police. For the next 36 hours, Donnelly hid out at the home of another woman who lived on the same street as him. That situation eventually came to a head when he uh, was asking for, for sex from her and she refused and he ended up hitting her over the head with a, with a stool. Not only had he murdered somebody in horrific fashion, but he then attacked a second woman uh, for refusing to have sex with him. left uh, all kinds of traces at the scene, DNA evidence. He left his keys, which had a personal picture on, on the keys and, and were clearly identifiable as his. In spite of the damning evidence against him, Donnelly refused to admit his guilt. Donnelly stayed silent in interview. He gave a no comment and he pushed the case all the way to trial. On the first day at the Old Bailey, Donnelly suddenly changed his plea to guilty, but he never presented a motive for his crime. I was present in court on the day of the trial when he changed his plea to guilty, and the striking thing about Donnelly was he offered little emotion. He uh, was a blank face, a blank canvas. On the 21st of July, 2016, Donnelly was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison and told he must serve a minimum of 23 years. He was also given an 18-month sentence for the assault of a woman he attacked to run concurrently with a life term. This case shows that um, you may think that you've got to know somebody through messaging, pictures and sharing details, but you don't really know who they are until you meet up. And, and by that point, you might be in a vulnerable situation and it might be too late. The thing about technology is it doesn't matter how many millions of people use it correctly, how many good things come from it, unless you use it safely, you are putting yourself at risk. Good people meet terrible ends because they trust the myths that others tell them online. And that's the real tragedy here.